I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. And now I will turn things over to my colleague, Dennis Massey, Program Officer with the OCLC RLP, who will kick things off for us. Thanks, Mercy, and thanks everybody for joining us today for this webinar about outcomes and next steps from this year's policy rethink that took place throughout last year and in the early part of this year. Zach Lane, Beth Posner, and I will be talking about how the policy rethink came about, what some of the outcomes have been, and what some of the next steps for shares and for Zach and Beth will be. We'll talk about this from three distinct points of view. I'll start out the program by providing some context, and then we'll come back at the end to do the, the wrap-up. And I'll be speaking from the point of view of the longtime coordinator of shares. What else would I do? Zach Lane of Columbia University, and by the way, this year's winner of the Virginia Voucher Award, will speak from the point of view of a shares executive group member. <clears throat> Zach was a member of the SEG in 2017, the year when the policy rethink was conceived and designed, and again last year when the discussions actually took place uh, with some exciting and far-reaching results. Then Beth Posner of the Graduate Center, CUNY, will speak from the point of view of a newcomer to shares who earlier this year joined the SHARES Best Practices Working Group. Beth is already pretty far along in leading a reciprocal on-site access subgroup of the Best Practices Working Group. She'll share her thoughts about how we as a consortium can build upon the outcomes of the policy rethink to keep SHARES vibrant and delivering maximum value to patron and staff at SHARES libraries across the globe. So we hope to save 15 minutes or so at the end of the webinar for questions and discussion, which is a good opportunity for you to chime in about challenges you're facing at your own institutions and to weigh in on how SHARES partners and OCLC research can work together to, to help um, address those challenges. If you're attending this webinar, chances are you already know a little something about SHARES. So in, in, um, in many ways, SHARES is like most resource sharing consortia. We, we uh, share our collections. We go the extra mile for each other. We come together in various ways to address challenges that we hold in common. But there are some things that make SHARES special. The, the mix of library types is one. The transnational membership. The degree to which we collaborate and push the envelope. SHARES is also something of a melting pot. Just about every SHARES institution is also part of multiple other resource sharing consortia. This allows for a great deal of cross-pollinization when it comes to ideas about trying things in a new way and finding more ways to get to yes as a lender. So the shares policy rethink really grew out of the 2017 shares executive group taking a close look at the shares website, of all things, as we prepared to start recruitment efforts to bring in some new partners. What we saw made us realize that not only could the website stand for some refreshing, and it still could, uh, but so many of our policies and guidelines were also uh, in need of, of some, some revisiting. So we decided to spend 2018 engaging in conversations across shares, conversations that were equal parts brainstorming, soul searching, and reporting on what we've all been trying at our own shops around five major themes. More about those five themes in a second. And this year's policy rethink was born. Then in 2018, the, uh, the new version of the Shares Exec Group, with some overlap from the previous year, took up the baton and helped flesh out each of the five themes, adding some suggested activities and new approaches under each theme, and, and making a specific recommendation for a way forward on each. As always, the best ideas came from the consortium's most valuable assets, you, the Shares participants. The five themes were encourage evidence-based processes, build in flexibility, enhance access, embrace local procedures that add value, and mitigate international sharing costs. So we put all these themes up on the website. Many of you will recall you took place and you took part in these conversations. Then we marched through them one at a time, uh, spending a couple of months on each one. Most of the discussion happened on the shares L listserv, and some also took place at in-person meetings. 
<clears throat> we had some game-changing outcomes, many of which came from ideas brought over from other consortia. Zach brought in the idea of extended loan periods, which grew out of analysis he'd done of Columbia CERC data and sharing within the Ivy Plus's borrow direct group. A subgroup of shares started a no charge for copies uh, club within shares. We started a reciprocal on-site borrowing pilot project among seven shares institutions and established a new working group on sharing special collections. And hey, that working group is having their own webinar on July 9th. Maybe I've overstated the outcome about anyone being able to borrow pretty much anything, but many shares participants have reported eliminating restrictions on borrowing items owned by the library, with some doing away uh, with recalls completely. Many are also willing to borrow and lend things like bound serials and textbooks. And we developed a list of things we can do to mitigate the cost of international sharing, including finding cheap alternatives to, to borrowing, cheaper alternatives to borrowing returnables from overseas. So we didn't just have interesting conversations, we changed our behaviors. And now we're ready to build upon those changes and keep the ball rolling for shares experimentation and innovation. Whoops, whoopsie whoops, went too far. There we go. <clears throat> I'm about to turn the microphone over to Zach and Beth to talk about some of the ways that they and we as a consortium will be building upon the policy rethink outcomes. Then I'll come back around at the end to talk a little bit about what the 2019 Shares Exec Group plans to do to move the rock forward. So now over to Zach Lane of Columbia University, who was instrumental in the development and rollout, and yes, the overall success of the Shares Policy Rethink. Zach. And Zach is muted. There you go. Hi, Dennis. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. So uh, I'm I'm back. I'm back to talk about a topic that uh, I have a feeling several or many of you have heard me talk about before, uh, with a, a similar title, uh, a similar, somewhat nonsense title. Hit them with the carrot. This is the update part two. Um, most of my titles revolve around the idea of how libraries design, design policies uh, around user behavior and transgression. And so I have been an advocate for a while of, of a metaphor of the carrot and the stick in the way that Columbia at least has enforced late fines and lost fees. Um, but really this all originated uh, not only in, in my local consortium, the IB Plus Consortium, uh, but when I became a member of the executive group and there was really a, a wider platform um, for, for me to, to talk about these things with, uh, with colleagues, uh, to throw around ideas, advocate for change. Um, and it was, it was a great way to surface the things that we had been doing locally and have that really magnified. And, and it gave me a platform to share out. Uh, the research that I've been doing uh, to essentially take these conversations and discussions to a different level. And there's been uh, a fair amount of interest uh, and discussion and action uh, around some of these things I've been talking about. Uh, and so well, what have I been talking about? I've been talking about a, a few uh, pockets of data analysis uh, around user behavior uh, here at Columbia. Uh, particularly involving uh, activity in Borrow Direct, which is our, our borrowing and lending mechanism for the Ivy Plus Consortium. Um, and that analysis, thinking and outcomes, dovetailed with things that were, were being uh, uh, rethought uh, in that the policy rethink and, and shares, particularly encouraging evidence-based processes and enhancing access. Um, and a notable outcome of that has been uh, a, a wider scale adoption of a 16-week loan period when it comes to um, resource sharing in a library loan. Uh, and so this presentation is a, is a quick review of some of that data, um, the analysis, some of the themes, some of the outcomes. Uh, but in particular, I wanted to get to a description of some of the unexpected consequences uh, at least local consequences of, of, uh, of these changes. Uh, let's see here. So when I talk about hitting people with a carrot, uh, I'm really talking about the way that we design our policies to um, enhance user experience. And uh, when I won that award recently, my university librarian came to visit me and asked, I heard you won this award, 
well, what for? And she was aware that you know, I had been advocating for longer loan periods. And I said, well, you know, I, I go and I present on this data and analysis at Columbia and it's an influence borrow direct. And one common outcome is, is that there's a, uh, there's a movement towards longer loan periods. But I said, it's not about longer loan periods. And Universal High Brand says, well, what's it about? And I said, well, it's really about fear and control. And, and looking at um, what user behavior uh, exhibits in our, in our data and the way that we can change our policies to uh, enhance their experience. And so what I looked at in particular is large-scale consortia transaction data to, to really show that there's little risk involved with sharing returnables. Uh, and also looking at our local fine distribution to suggest that users needed more time with the material that they were borrowing. And one immediate local result of the increase from 12 to 16 weeks in borrow direct was essentially the collapse of fines accruing for patrons at all. Uh, and this screenshot is from an email that I sent to some colleagues that illustrates these changes over time. And what I did is in January of 2017, 2018, and 2019, was to look back at the total number of fines that had accrued in the previous quarter. So line by line, these are the total number of fines that accrued October, November, and December in the previous year. So looking at fines in 2016, 2017, and 2018. We made the, the increase from a 12 to 16 week loan period in, in 2017. And so what we found from January 2017 to January 2018 is that there was essentially a net reduction of the total number of fines by more than 90% which essentially validated our hypothesis from the data that if we gave users a longer loan period, fewer books would be overdue, fewer fines would accrue, we would have fewer negative interactions around fines. Notably, Columbia eliminated all fines uh, last year um, in fall 2018. So when we look at the data from October, November, and December 2018, we see that it has continued to fall, but the majority of that reduction simply had to do with extending a loan period. So what actually happened? Uh, there was a lot of outcomes from the work that I did, and I'm just gonna run through a whole bunch of bullet points about what some of these things were. There's a lot to talk about here, uh, but I'm going to skim through quickly to get to some data. Uh, Consortium-wide in IV Plus, we increased our loan period from 12 to 16 weeks. We decided to uh, greatly reduce uh, the invoices we were sending to one another. The, uh, the patterns that we saw indicated that all of our users essentially did not return things at a similar rate. No one's patrons were worse than any others. And essentially what we were doing was trading an equal number of invoices, creating a lot of work for us and creating no revenue. Um, we rationalized, at Columbia, we rationalized our local loan periods during a shift to the recap shared collection, uh, which I could talk about at length. It's a really big deal for us a year and a half ago. It's, it's exceedingly boring. Um, we changed our local interlibrary loan period from six weeks with perpetual renewals to 16 weeks no renewal uh, to begin to create a, a uniform experience for anyone, any institution borrowing from us. Uh, we made this change nearly, I think, maybe more than two years ago now. Uh, we wanted to move very quickly into that space. We have also, um, three weeks ago, gone through a, a big generational change in our loan periods. Uh, extending many out to term loans, using 16 weeks as another benchmark, and maxing out renewals in many places. We have, in our resource sharing unit, integrated uh, acquisition routines in a number of different places. Uh, I'm eventually going to loop back around to this uh, and relate it to how we're handling uh, recalls. Uh, we now have a, we've gone from essentially zero dollars to a $25,000 acquisition budget per year. Uh, we put a lot of energy into shifting our focus from renewals to the integrity of recall. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk a lot about recalls. 
what I really care about are recalls on behalf of a lending institution, the institution that has, has lent their books to a Columbia user, and making sure that they have trust in our integrity to get their books back. Uh, and so there's this wider recall rethink that I'll be, I'll be discussing. We have also adjusted some of our penalties. Uh, casual late fines were eliminated. It's still a secret from all of our uh, students and faculty even though it's been in place for uh, about nine months now. Uh, but in, in, in the spirit of carrot and the stick, late fines being a stick, blocking account and unblocking account being a carrot, um, we have shortened the time to lost an account block from 45 to 30 days. Our conclusion is this is a much more effective means to affect the return of a book um, and provides a, actually a much more pleasant uh, interaction with the patron. And we have aligned our resource sharing resources to promote efficiency and a positive user experience. Uh, uh, shares is obviously a big feature of this, but we've also spent a lot of time working with the IDS project and, and RAPID uh, on new services and routines. So just before I dive into data, uh, there's a few things I, I like to sort of highlight. Among them is Columbia users love Borrow Direct, and when we have Borrow Direct meetings between all the, the institutions, it usually happens at least once a year. Uh, this is a very common theme. Everyone's users love Borrow Direct. They get a very consistent, um, fast, predictable sort of experience, um, and it, it's, it's akin to what Amazon has done in the commercial place, in the commercial uh, space. Uh, our data indicates that uh, essentially people can be trusted, uh, that they, they more often than not overwhelmingly act in good faith. Uh, so that's both, both in the data and anecdotally. Um, we've made a lot of changes to try and, and, and reduce the number of uncomfortable interactions we have with our, our, our students and faculty. Uh, and a, a very important theme in those uh, interactions uh, or promote shared values. And so when we talk about in, enforcing the return of a book, uh, to be able to lead with, we care about the book, not the money, tends to make a conversation go very smoothly. So the data that we're looking at uh, has a purpose. So I, I'm gonna try and tell a story with this data. It tends to be a little nonlinear, and I'm gonna do the best I can to make it cogent. Um, it's also been about a year since I've talked through this. So context is very important. Columbia is increasingly dependent as a borrower in resource sharing. Uh, and I'm, I have some data to highlight this. Lending, uh, our lending data strongly suggests that Columbia can be a confident and generous lender. More often when we get involved with uh, uh, things like Rapid, we get up with lending long before we're up with a borrowing routine. We feel very comfortable uh, doing that. Uh, punishment for our users. Fine distribution suggested that, uh, well, actually, fine distribution suggests preferred terms of use and the nuances of erratic human behavior. And in terms of collection development, we can leverage activity data to make routinized decisions. So now diving into data, this is a, a quick illustration of the numbers involved in Borrow Direct, relatively large numbers. Every year these days, there's about 60,000 transactions for Columbia in terms of borrowing and lending. The blue line is what we borrow. The red line is what we lend. There is load balancing across the consortium, so everyone is more or less lending the same amount. Some institutions are net lenders, some are net borrowers, uh, which creates a difference in perspective between uh, those different institutions. This is a look, not borrow direct, but of activity um, by Columbia users here on Morningside campus. This is an illustration of system-wide uh, circulation activity across both our own collections, borrow direct, reserves, and um, offsite. This is a focus of that same data, but just the last eight years. And I focus in on these eight years because historically we did not always include borrow direct circulation activity. And so within these eight years, we can break it down between those four major collections, general collections, reserves, 
off-site material and things borrowed through borrow direct. When we slow down year by year and look at the percentage of that borrow direct circulation activity in the context of everything being borrowed, seven years ago, borrow direct accounted for a little over 5% of overall use of returnables. This year, it's over 12%. Borrow Direct accounts for about 80% of what we're borrowing um, in returnables. That other 20% is interlibrary loan. So a truer percentage, uh, a reflection of uh, the amount of returnable activity that the four Columbia patrons of books borrowed from other institutions is closer to 15%. That's a big, that's a big number, in my opinion. So uh, back to the carrot and the stick. Past changes, borrow direct has increased to 16 weeks, ILL up to 16 weeks, a larger adoption of a 16-week loan period. Uh, and one of our core questions, something that gives us um, something to think about locally, is at what point do we want to extend that uniform user experience to an interlibrary loan? At what point does Columbia feel comfortable taking a model that has been adopted by a few other institutions at this point to give a standard loan period, circulation, circulating loan period, to anything borrowed through ILL, regardless of what the lender stipulated. What we felt for a long time is that we haven't been ready to do that because so many people aren't comfortable with the longer loan period. But as more institutions move, into that space, um, we feel that we want to do the majority of the, our interlibrary loan activity with these like-minded institutions, and Columbia certainly wants to start by being a role model for the preferred uh, behavior. So I'm going to jump back to the data that let us feel comfortable uh, no longer pursuing invoicing, uh, gave us uh, more comfort in uh, aggregate user behavior. This is what I trotted out at, at different conferences to illustrate how we modeled uh, this large-scale consortial activity. I'm not really going to talk about it in detail other than to point out in the top right corner that the net non-return rate um, is calculated at about 0.2 of 1%, uh, which is at, as a percentage of our lending activity is about 50 books a year that aren't returned after a year in borrow direct. This slide represents the purpose of this data was not originally to model this behavior. The purpose of this was actually to help chase down invoices, uh, but it became useful for other purposes. And this is uh, active working reports that I continue to compile. Um, my next one will be arriving in about a month, and that will complete four, four years of data. So we feel that over time this data has been very consistent, um, and it continues to be a, a good illustration of that user behavior en masse. And just a reminder, this is lending activity, so the adherence to these loan periods is uh, on uh, the responsibility of patrons at all 12 of our partner institutions. So these aren't Columbia users, these are everyone else's users. A lot of times when I present this, um, especially locally to selectors, selectors get very concerned, all right, well, you know how many books aren't returned after a period of time, but what about those specific titles? You seem unconcerned about them, but you know, how do you know we should not be concerned? And my response is, well, we actually have granular data about all of the books that were not returned, and we know a lot about them. We can look at how many copies Columbia owns of all these non-return titles. We can look at how many copies are in the consortium, and we can look at how many are available in WorldCat. And what we find is more than 50% of the time, Columbia owns another copy of this book that has not been returned. There are 7.8 copies in the Borrow Direct Consortium, and on average, there are nearly 400 titles, which strongly indicates that the majority of these titles are uh, easy to replace. It also strongly um, reflects our perception that 
when we route these titles for replacement, it's unlikely that selectors will actually opt to do that. So collectively, we've opted to greatly reduce our invoicing. What we do uh, at Columbia is we focus on the titles where there are very few copies, either in Borrow Direct or in OCLC, and we concentrate our energy on recovering those. And in those cases, we don't actually invoice. We reach out to our partner institutions uh, to encourage them, to encourage their patron to return the book. Uh, on average, there is um, one book on that situation per quarter. Okay, so I, I've talked a lot about that data in the past. Uh, it has led to a lot of change. Uh, change can be problematic uh, for many different reasons. People are afraid of change. Uh, there are always unforeseen consequences, and there have been some unforeseen consequences of extended loan periods. And I wanted to talk about those, those impacts. There's been a problem with returns at Columbia, and there's been a problem with recalls at Columbia. And uh, I'm going to try and talk quickly because I think I've used a lot of time already. The quick topic is returns. So there was perception on, on the behalf of my staff that we began to have a heavy return load uh, in late January. And it, empirically, they are correct. I'm going to show you the data. Uh, and so it's a nuance of Voyager. Uh, our implementation of Voyager that has our service desks as closed during a non-due period that starts in the last day of finals and continues to Martin Luther King Day. So anything charged out uh, from early September, that 16-week loan period falls in this period and then gets kicked out until the day after King Day. So essentially everything charged out in fall uh, through Bar Direct is due the day after King Day. And that has yielded a very heavy return load at the very end of January when things were otherwise very busy in our office. And uh, empirically, that's a 30 to 35% increase. There's also been a perception that is, that is matched in the data that the same thing happens uh, at the end of May after graduation. Those spring due dates are kicking out uh, and people are returning all at the same time. Recalls. This is a little more complicated. Uh, and I'm going to try and move quickly because I'm going to be talking about both system-wide borrowing recalls, borrow direct borrowing recalls, and borrow direct lending recalls. And the important bit is at the end with lending recalls. And so I'm going I'm to skim over a little bit of this. Uh, recalls are where I will often get a, a pushback when I advocate for longer loan periods. Uh, there is a likelihood that recalls will increase with a longer loan period. There is a likelihood that loss will, uh, uh, or the non-return rate will increase with a longer loan period. But the question is in order of magnitude. These things are already happening at a very, very low rate. If they increase, they are still very, very low. Uh, and what we've seen locally is that recalls have been dropping for six years. This chart illustrates uh, that drop. And these are recalls for Columbia-owned collections specifically, so not really anything to do with Borrow Direct per se yet. Um, but when we look at Borrow Direct, I'm going to show you the data. It looks like I made a huge mistake at first, um, advocating for a longer loan period. And there, there was a mistake, but it's not what it appears to be. Uh, what, we, what we have shown in the data is the Borrow Direct recalls have continued to drop even with the 16-week loan period, and this is for, for borrowing recalls. So when you look at FY18 and that huge spike, uh, one would say that appears to be a problem. Why have recalls increased? But it should be noted that borrowing recalls can only be performed by Columbia staff. They have to be mediated. Partner systems communicate uh, usually via automated email with our staff who then place a mediated recall. And back when this whole process began, my mindset was to try and be a well-patrolled borrower rather than a mindful, assiduous lender, and we designed workflow accordingly. And this too, I'm gonna to skim past very, very quickly. So the way I talk about this with my staff 
is when it comes to these automated communications coming from the library uh, management systems, uh, they run on these timelines. And there's actually two timelines involved with all of this activity. There's the timeline for the borrowing institution, when we check something out to our patron, but there's also a timeline for the lending institution, and they run in parallel. The challenge is that our timeline is known, fixed, configured uh, in our CERC matrix. We, we know what the timing is. We know when Columbia's courtesy notice will be sent out. We know when the overdues are coming through. But uh, our partners all have different timelines for these communications. We decided to interpret being well patrolled is not just recalling when they submit a recall. We interpreted well patrolled being we will recall from our own patron when we get overdue notices. And this we configured institution by institution based on their sensitivity to uh, the integrity of just return overall. Some institutions uh, would be in touch with us as books just became overdue. Others simply didn't care so much. Uh, and we took a uh, holistic look at all the email messages coming through from all of our partners. We cataloged them uh, and created email filters to indicate to our staff whether they needed to take no action, whether they should recall a book, or whether we needed to be directly in touch with our patron to encourage return. This was complicated. This took a long time to set up. And the unintended consequence was something that we didn't know about Voyager, which was if we recalled an overdue book, then the recall fine rate would apply for all the days that, that book was overdue, essentially levying an undue punishment on our own user. It took us a year to figure that out. And when we figured it out, we realized this is not tenable. We can't do this. Frankly, this is a lot of work anyways. And we decided to simplify and say, all right, we're just going to recall when our patrons or our partners want us to recall. Uh, that's what we do now. There's been a lot of discussion in the operations group about how to handle recalls. And there's been no uh, 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 decision yet besides the importance of recalls and that staff should always recall regardless of whether a message is uh, automated or comes staff to staff. We at Columbia reflected on our previous behavior with borrowing recalls and decided to change the model for our lending recalls. What we did is we realized our Voyager system was sending these automated email messages to each of these partners individually. When we lent a book, we charged out the book to a status patron that corresponded with the borrowing institution. We had 12 different status patrons for the 12 partners. Each of those status patrons had an email address that corresponded to the resource sharing staff at that institution. Those staff were receiving a multitude of these messages from us, and the only one Columbia cared about was the recall message. This was replicated for all 12 partners. This slide just has six because I didn't have time to put in all 12, but I think everyone gets the point. It's a mess. We turned that around and substituted our own email address in that partner's status patron record. So our staff would get all of these messages. The upshot is there's consistent text for all of these messages coming from our Voyager system. It's very simple to build email filters. And our filter was essentially, it's a recall or it means nothing to us. And we began to uh, mediate these recalls. When we would receive them, we would send a message staff to staff asking a partner institution to recall a book. But then we decided to ask, why is the user recalling a book? Why is the Columbia patron recalling this book from a partner institution? And are there better alternatives? And what we found is that um, most of the time there were better alternatives. 90% of the recalls being placed to things that Columbia has lent to other institutions can and are now being canceled. About 30%, um, there's another copy available on campus. We ask our user to use that copy. Uh, 30%, uh, we can place a mediated request through Borrow Direct and borrow a copy from another institution. 
and 30% 30, 30 of the time we're acquiring, we're purchasing more copies of that book. Um, almost all, in all these cases, we can deliver that book faster, um, and it is a type of passive collection development strategy that focuses on how many copies are too few copies. Uh, so an example would be somebody recalls a book from another institution, every single bar direct partner owns a copy, all are in use. It strongly suggests that there's just not enough copies yet within the consortium to satisfy the demand from our users. The problem with this is it's a little labor intensive. My final slide is a terrible illustration of an oversimplified demand curve uh, that's very old, that was one of the seeds of some of these conversations, uh, is meant to illustrate on like an XY axis, demand versus the number of holdings, and the number of holdings being collectively in OCLC. Um, demand going from zero upwards, uh, the number of holdings actually on the left being a large number of holdings, and the long tail off to the right is a low number of holdings. This pink rectangle in the middle represents the happy zone of consortial activity, where a large consortium can satisfy a lot of this demand for things that are relatively rarely held or commonly held, and there's a, a modest or even a slightly high um, amount of demand. But as demand exceeds the number of holdings, or as the holdings are rare enough uh, that no one holds it, uh, borrow direct uh, can't satisfy, can't meet those demands. And in our theory is, in a couple of these cases, sometimes the costs are very low to acquire more copies to be able to meet the consortial demand, not just the Columbia, but the consortial demand. Uh, or um, even at the other end, it still may be um, more effective in terms of uh, the terms of use uh, to purchase our own copy. But uh, that's all I've got. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. Um, I've got some questions piling up. We'll save them for the end. Uh, I've got, I could sit down and talk to you about this all day. Thanks for sharing all that and, and analysis. And wow, that whiteboard really needs a bath, but that's a great, uh, that's a great picture there at the end. So moving on to, to, uh, to hear from Beth. Now we're here from Beth Posner, who brought the graduate uh, CUNY, Graduate Center CUNY, I'll get this said into SHARES this year, and uh, she's really hit the ground running, taking a leadership role on the SHARES Best Practices Working Group. And she brings her valuable experience working on other collaborative resource sharing efforts too, such as uh, the Rethinking Resource Sharing Initiative. So Beth, over to you. And can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So we're going to move from some of Zach's fascinating specifics to the current work that SHARES is doing on best practices and what we expect to come from our current and future efforts. Um, as Dana said, my library is a new SHARES member, and my interest and experience is in best practices and working together with each other to provide the best service to all of our library users. My colleagues here at the Graduate Center and I are big believers in the value and the power of library cooperation and collaboration. And we support library resource sharing specifically because of all the information access it provides to our users and to the world. So we're always looking for ways to work with others who share the same beliefs and values and mission, which certainly includes shares. To that end, as Dan said, we belong to several library consortia. We recognize that consortia can help us advocate and support libraries, both to outside agencies, to any library funders, and to our own administrators who don't know as much about what we do and what we can do. We can also help each other in the practical details of what we do in interlibrary loan so that we can do things like decrease turnaround times, increase full rates and loan periods, and meet all our library user needs. And we joined SHARE specifically because we know how much the members care about working together to do all this. Um, SHARE's libraries are among the best libraries in our field. Its collective collection constitutes one of the best resources. Um, all of the activities that you've heard about from Dennis and Zach are things that we value 
And you can see here some of the partner benefits listed on the OCLC website, which also um, constitute best practices. So let's take a step back and think about what is best. When we say something's best, we may automatically think in terms of superlatives. Um, a competitive concept of the best may come to mind, the idea that there's one something that is the best something out of everything. But just what is best or a best practice can quickly become complicated. As librarians and as library partners, we're actually unlikely to come to one overarching universal solution about the best way to do everything because technology and conditions and even philosophies can and do change what's possible and because there are differences among us. But what we can do, what we should do, and what we are doing is to continually evaluate what is possible. We should keep rethinking what we're doing, keep earning it, and never stop working to provide the best services. In the world of libraries and library partnerships like SHARES, we should also remember that we do not need to be competing to be the best. Instead, our work is informed by the spirit and the practice of working together to help each other offer the best services for all of us, all of our colleagues, all of our library users. And we have seen that by working together rather than by competing, how much we can do. So specifically thinking about best practices, what we want to do is offer guidance about what's correct or most effective because it's a positive way to approach our work and to make positive changes. We can point to best practices as we advocate for resources because if we say this is what we need to be doing, it's an accepted standard, it's more likely to get support. Best practices offer helpful hints about how to make things work as well as possible, and we don't each have to reinvent the wheel every time we face the same challenges. So SHARES members can look to a variety of existing best practices as we develop and implement our own. Actually, many SHARES members have been a part of developing these and disseminating these and implementing these in the library resource sharing community at large. And these are not even all of them, which, you know, might make you think, okay, so what is best? Um, but as I said, there are so many because well, some will offer a baseline, some will offer more innovative ways to excel, and library consortia have to recognize that different libraries with different users and resources will not, in all cases, agree on what's best. But it's this difference in members, libraries of consortia that's also a strength of consortia. And best practices that we can all agree with are a great way of helping us stay strong, attract new members, and re-energize our existing membership. They're a way to help us each do more, and while reasonable librarians can certainly disagree, there is also a lot of, of agreement, at least among those of us who are supported with enough budget and staff and technology. So specifically, the SHARES Best Practice Working Group that's currently working um, started this year. There are about 12 of us involved, and these are just some of the topics that we've um, started thinking about moving forward with include things like enabling better access to special collections, working with other consortia, e-delivery, sort of all of the hot topics of the interlibrary loan world. Specifically, the one I've been working most on is reciprocal on-site access, which as it works now is something that enables members of SHARES libraries to go to other SHARES libraries um, with their local ID cards. But this, like many things, can get complicated very quickly. We've found out that some IDs don't have current validation stickers. Some may even be virtual. Um, some libraries restrict reciprocal access locally. And we never want to face a situation where any library user tries to go to another member library and either has a problem getting in or maybe has a problem accessing material because they didn't realize it was off site. So we're working to find out how our libraries are handling it right now and then identifying any potential issues and offering some solutions and recommended ways forward to avoid any problems. And because SHARES members are at the forefront of library resource sharing and we want to do all we can to share more, this work on best practices also gives us an opportunity to go beyond existing ones 
to innovate and to push the boundaries of traditional ILL so that we all can share more and do more and provide more access for more library users. Some of these ideas include things that SHARES has already started, such as not only reciprocal on-site access, but reciprocal on-site direct borrowing. Um, we might consider specific turnaround times, so just instead of saying fast turnaround, actually give a number. Um, we might pilot and advocate for the sharing of ebooks through controlled digital lending projects. We definitely want to work more with interconsortial cooperation, which can include all sorts of things, sharing of staff, expertise, collection development, and more. This process of coming up with best practices is definitely something we can all commit to and, some, and implementing them something we can all aspire to. And we want our recommendations to be based on real world data, such as Zach has shared with us, as well as real user stories. And we do want to push our service models to increase information access for all. We understand the challenges involved in determining and implementing things like this, but we also know that doing so offers us a great opportunity to consider and debate, think about and decide what works and why, and what isn't working and how to make it better. So back to Dennis. Thank you so much, Beth. And I will say on, on a personal note, I'm so glad you're in shares and I'm glad that your 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 institution has joined and and that you're so active and you're just jumping right in and um contributing already and leading. And it's great to see. So I'm really delighted that that you're with us. Thanks so much. Um Let's see, I'm the presenter now. Okay, I'll click there. Um, before we open it up for questions and comments, we, we've, got, we've got just about 10 minutes left. I just want to speak really briefly about what comes next. Now we have a new roster of shares executives. Well, new, it is, it is June. So they've been doing this for a few months now. They're busy coalescing as a group and putting the finishing touches on a work plan for, for 2019. Carl and Elise um, are finishing, they're, they're doing their second year of their two-year term, so they bring last year's experience and, and wisdom forward. There's a little bit less overlap than usual this time. Uh, because of a retirement and someone changing jobs, we actually turned over usually four execs stay on and four rotate off each year. So now we've got a case where we've got six new ones, so we've got a lot of, uh, of fresh perspectives in, uh, coming into the group. These folks will be back again next year, the ones in green, so we'll have a lot of continuity. So whatever we're work we start working on uh, in 2019, we'll, we'll be able to build on that momentum pretty powerfully in 2020. So the 2019 Shears Exec Group is putting its own stamp on how they'll go about doing their business. Last year, the rethink was about policy and practice. Um, this year's group has chosen to focus on areas of need where shares can work to have an impact and then team up with folks in other resource sharing consortia to broaden and enrich and, and amplify that impact. The three areas identified by the group are making accessibility of ILO materials routine rather than an exception. And I know a lot of group folks are talking about this and, and other groups are heavily invested in that already, like, like the Big Ten, for instance. Advocating internally for the value of resource sharing collections and for the adoption of specific policies and practices. Um, Zach gave us some good examples of, of how, how, how you can go about that. And the building up of the skill sets of resource sharing practitioners and managers. I know um, the IDS, uh, project uh, has a really strong program with their on online learning institute and with mentoring. So there's a lot of folks working in that area already as well. Um, so the, the trick will be for our shares to see where we can um, we can make our own contributions, not not necessarily reinvent the wheel, uh, but to find places where there is a need and a gap and a natural place for shares to contribute. So you'll be hearing quite a lot about these themes and how the exec group plans to address them and to engage with you around them in the coming weeks and months. Um, meanwhile, these two shares working groups have, they've been mentioned previously uh, across all our, our remarks. Um, They've taken the policy rethink baton and are running fast with it. They're, they're doing work that will inject some fresh vitality and creativity and, yes, boundary pushing into the shares environment. I, I fully anticipate that the innovations and knowledge creation that comes out of these efforts will bring substantial benefit to all who are part of the resource sharing community. So exciting times, really productive, smart, energetic people that are uh, pointing their efforts toward this, and there's much work uh, 
that is great that is being done. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening, to thank Zach and Beth for sharing their thoughts. We just have about eight minutes left for, for questions and comments. Um, I do see that a question came in via chat for Zach. Let me scroll down there so I can see it. Um, Zach, did you did I hear you say that Columbia has eliminated all patron fines? If so, I'm wondering if that has had an effect on getting materials back, especially since Borrow Direct Libraries no longer invoice for lost items. That's from Kate McCready. And you're muted. Uh, hi, Dennis. That's a great question. And and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to qualify some of those things. Uh, so we did eliminate what what I call casual patron fines. So this is like your regular you have a due date, it becomes overdue. It used to be 25 cents a day. We no longer have a fine in that scenario. We have maintained our fines for overdue recalls and for overdue reserves, and and it's like a, there's a small category of um, special collections like our, our research DVDs. Our fines still do accrue. Um, and while we've eliminated those fines, we've maintained the account block and the replacement fee that's added if the book becomes uh, exceptionally overdue. Uh, the, the previous timeline was 45 days to a book going lost and having a $100 fine added to your account for replacement, uh, which triggered a block. If there's a, uh, more than $99 in fines in a user's account, they become blocked. They can't check things out. They can't renew anything. They can't use electronic resources. There's a number of uh, relatively negative consequences to having your account blocked. So we've actually made that process of uh, getting blocked a little more rigorous by shortening that timeline to 30 days. Uh, like I don't have empirical evidence that uh, we've had any trouble getting materials back. Uh, and, nor anecdotal evidence that, that this has become a problem. Um, uh, when it comes to it no longer invoicing, uh, we do have a policy, and essentially our policy states it's not that we're not going to invoice. We, we retain the right to invoice under any circumstances, but our policy essentially gives us a little more uh, uh, guidance for how we intend to use that discretion. Um, and there's there's sort of exceptions to everything. There can be lots of reasons a book doesn't get returned. I was talking to somebody last week about the, the dog eating a book exception. Uh, since anything can happen, sooner or later a dog is going to eat a book. And the last few years since I've been at Columbia, we've had two of these situations where um, a, a patron at a, at a bar direct partner library has had their dog ate the book. In both situations, this is a commonly held title, not expensive to replace, and uh, I, I put forward the position that if, if they can take a picture of the dog and take a picture of the book that they ate, I'm willing to wipe the fine. Uh, essentially saying uh, if, if you're acting in good faith, this is kind of hilarious and we'll accept that this is just sort of the stuff that happens in life. Um, but no, we haven't seen any, uh, uh, we haven't seen behavior worsen in any way. Thanks. In any significant way. That's good. That's good to hear. Um, if you have other questions, um, type them in the chat. We still have about four minutes left. <clears throat> in the meantime, I have one that I'd like to address to both um, Beth and Zach. Beth, we'll start with you. Let me put you, put you on the spot. Um, the question is the same for both. Uh, one of the themes for the Shares Exec Group uh, this coming year is advocating internally for policies and practices, uh, collection sharing, and also for the value of the service. I'm curious if either of you have advice uh, for us uh, about how, how you've been able to do that. Um, like Beth joining shares, and then you're, you're going to have to go through a lot with uh, opening it up to on-site access visitors. I know that you, on a trial basis, are, are not currently charging shares members when you fill a request. Um, any, any advice for others about how you um, how best to navigate uh, advocating for those things internally? And you are muted. Yeah. Yep. Thank okay. Um, so I'm a big advocate for pilot projects. They're less scary and they give you real data, which are two things that are necessary to make change. So, you know, if you have an idea that's pushing the boundaries, why not try it? But tell everyone if it doesn't work, we're not going to keep doing it. 
it's the only way, though, that we'll find out if it does work. And um, we've had some success with that. Excellent. Zach, anything to, to add to that? I know you've, you've, you've had, a, just in your descriptions of analyzing this data, then you've had to get buy-in from, from your upperlings as well as you, you've gotten into a lot of, of trouble to uh, get buy-in from the staff uh, working for you as well. Anything, any advice for us? Well, uh, I think having, having the large data sets uh, that can be consistently modeled over time helps a lot. Uh, I've found that it, it's necessary to have like many different types of conversations with different library staff, uh, that there's no like formula for really affecting change, uh, but y you want to adapt your method to the personalities you're dealing with sometimes. Uh, like a lot of times the way that I would address like sort of potential policy changes, it's necessary to, to often go in front of groups, uh, but to preempt like those presentations by talking to individuals. Uh, I, I like to take an iterative approach to almost all these things. Things are always complicated and complex in all sorts of different ways. I like to say that systems are complicated, but user behavior is complex, people are complex. Uh, and by sort of testing out like some of those ideas on individuals, you'll get some really good feedback uh, for, for when you take it to a larger group. And you also have a likelihood if you have one or two or a few individuals that have a little more buy-in during uh, sort of like conversations around those topics. Uh, and it does help to have sort of, well, especially with my support staff, to be able to really explain what's happening and why it's happening. Um, I would say when it comes to support staff, being willing to accept their emotional reaction is really important, um, which can often be negative, um, um, and giving them time to, um, to think about things and, and change that, that reaction is key to not going crazy. Fantastic. Thank you, Zach. That's very good advice. It's all about the human element. I'll turn it back over to Mercy. I want to thank everyone for, for joining with us today, and also thanks so much to Zach and Beth for, for all, the, all that you shared with us. Mercy, any last second to housekeeping as we're at the top of the hour? Yes, just again, thanks to all, to our panelists, to all of you, our audience, for your participation and for joining us. Um, we will send out an email um, uh, with a, we'll post a recording of this online uh, webinar and we'll notify you by email when it's available. Thanks again for joining us and this concludes today's webinar. Thanks all. Bye.